All right, so Matt, I, I spent all day setting up a suit of armor in Michael's room, and I installed light bulbs inside of it and everything. And when Michael got home, he was confused. He was like, what is this? And I was like, well, dude, you told me you wanted a nightlight. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> it would look pretty cool. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. All right, everybody, here we are again. Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? Well, I'm alive. Yep. <laughs> yep. We're glad about that. I know That's you're good. feeling Just, pretty bad. Uh, so. Yeah, a little under a little under the weather, but the show must go on. There you go. So we're trudging through it here, and you give Matt a pat on the back whenever you see him for making his way through this. Um, first of all, we'd like to say go check out podbelly.com. We're proud members of the Podbelly Network. Um, you can find different ways to record your show, or you can find other shows to listen to if you'd like to do that. Uh, we'd also like to thank tonight's sponsor, BetterHelp. Um, and we want to thank you guys for sending in all of the stories that you have sent in for Christmas. Uh, we have gotten more than we could have ever imagined, and more than we ever have gotten before um the deadline when this episode goes live will be a couple days um but so you still got a little bit of time to get it in if you're listening to this on the day that it goes live um but wanted to let everybody know we've got so many that it's going to be a two-parter um and we'll talk about this in in subsequent episodes before the time but we're going to be um we're, we're going to turn it into a two-parter there for you guys, um, since y'all were so kind as to get us so many stories. You guys have no yeah, that's idea. that's right. Y'all knocked it out of the park oh, yeah. this year. I mean, we have been flooded with great, great stories, and we're looking forward to, uh, to reading all of them to you to uh, celebrate our old uh, victorian tradition of telling ghost stories around the fire so uh so yeah it's gonna be a lot of fun and you're gonna get two of them this year. yeah right so be double the fun uh before we get into it matt I, I wanted to tell you about this thing i heard it on another podcast uh, the meat eater podcast and i don't know if you've ever listened to that podcast at all but it's the guy that does the meat eater tv show he's got his own podcast um well, he, he was talking about they hunted in White Sands National Wildlife Reserve, and he was talking about something that's there in the White Sands National Wildlife Reserve. They have 10,000-year-old fossilized footprints that in a line, and there's about 400 of them that they've uncovered. They said by the size and shape and stuff of them, they figure it's a young man or a woman um, and they say that it, they're carrying a small child on the left hip. And you wonder how... How can they, how can they figure that? Right. Um, well, he said occasionally they stop and they put this kid down. So oh. they'll stop and then there'll be footprints of the little kid kind of wandering around as the person rests. But then they'll pick it back up and the gait changes. So there's a heavier footfall on the left side. So wow. they're able to tell all this just from the footprints. But the the footprints are going off in one direction, right? Well, occasionally stopping. Um, and they say it looks like they're jumping over something or, or stepping wide over something, like they're dodging things in the way. They don't know exactly what they were dodging. Um, but it may have been mud puddles because at the time when that, uh, that area got wet. It created the right environment for fossilized footprints. So it was probably mud puddles or something like that. But after the person passed through, 
they have found mammoth and giant sloth tracks going over these footprints. And then the person comes back through from the other way, stepping on the mammoth and giant sloth tracks, but not carrying the kid. So they took the kid, dropped it off somewhere, and then came back. And in the time it took to go to that place and come back, a mammoth and a giant sloth walked across that path. And when I heard that, that I was amazed. That is amazing. Right? I mean, you know, it's it's amazing enough just to find such a thing. Yes. But to be able to make those kind of inferences based on the subtle differences of the footprints, that's that's really impressive. But I even know. more so, finding these animals, finding evidence that these animals were right there with humans. Yep. You know, they you know, there's there's been a lot of speculation about well, you know, you know, dinosaurs lived thousands of years before humans did. Mm-hmm. Or and, and even if there was any crossover like with mammoths that you know, they didn't live in the same regions and there was probably limited if any interaction between those two creatures at all. Right, right. But but now we're seeing some evidence that there there could have been could have been a lot and, of interaction since it was uh, in that short time span of going and coming back, you know. Right. That, that means right. there was a I mean, lot that, around. That's amazing. So I heard that and and I was floored and I was like, I've got to go write this down real quick before I forget it, so I can tell Matt and all of you about that. And uh, so I heard about that on the Meat Eater podcast. I I did not go and find all that information myself so if it's wrong blame him um if you think it's cool uh if you think it's cool blame him too um that i I just i was impressed by that so yeah that that's all i got matt so why don't you tell us what are we talking about tonight okay so tonight we're, we're looking at another set of strange lights that still are truly unexplained. Mm -hmm. Okay. But this time we're, we're going to head down under to Australia and we're going to talk about the men, men lights. Oh yeah. Now, now we've talked about other lights like, you know, the, the Marfa lights and and things like this, um, where it's, it's just this strange phenomenon of these lights appearing in the sky sometimes close to the ground, sometimes getting very close to people, but the the interaction is such that you, you just have a hard time dismissing it as headlights or, or anything else, you know, and, and we've, we heard plenty of theories like that when we talked about the Marfa light. Right. Right. Um, and, and they've tried to do that here, but, but these lights are pretty unique and they're pretty common and they have pretty well been embraced um, by, by the, uh, the region where, where they occur um, even to some financial gain. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. But like you said, they're they're, weird. They're really interesting. Yeah, they are. And they're, and they're weird. You know, they are weird. So, so let's, let's, Let's get into this. Let's talk about the Min Min lights. All right. So you can, like we always say, go down to the bottom of our show notes and check out our sources so you can follow along or see where we're reading from. Um, one of the sources that we're going to, that we used for this is a documentary called Australian Skies 3 Search for the Min Min. So you can get that for free on Amazon video if you've got it. Um, if you're interested in this topic, I would suggest going and watching that because it, it's very interesting. Um, but the Men Men lights, like Matt said, are one of Australia's greatest supernatural mysteries. There's actually a sign on the way into Bullia, Queensland that reads, quote, for the next 120 kilometers, you are in land of the Men Men. This unsolved modern mystery is a light that at times follows travelers for long distances. It has been approached, but never identified. 
And I probably should have done that in my Australian accent, but I I, I didn't want to. I, <laughs> I didn't want to be offensive to Australians with how bad my Australian accent was. So <laughs> it's like his Australian accent reminds me of like Jim Carrey doing it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Put another strip on the Bobby. Yeah. You know, it, from Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> I wish you would have said like Robin Williams. That would have made me feel better. But no, you went with Jim Carrey. So the lights have been described by witnesses as floating, fast moving balls of color that glow in the night sky and stalk people, leaving some feeling confused and frightened. And that the the stalking people is something that we'll get into that kind of is different than a lot of these other mysterious lights. Um, The lights are also described as mostly round to watermelon shaped with fuzzy edges. Um, And they're actually named after the Min Min Hotel that was in that area that burnt down in 1918. Uh, This was a mail exchange, which used to stand on the boundary of two big cattle stations, Warinda and Lucknow. Um, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, but that's how you're getting it. Um, This was located between the outback towns of Bulia and Winton. Now, stories about the the lights can be found in Aboriginal myths that predate European settlement and have since become part of wider Australian folklore. So some people say that, you know, it didn't happen until after the Min Min Hotel burnt down. But actually, there's a lot of Aboriginal myths about the Min Min light. Um, They just call it something different since the Min Min Hotel wasn't around at the time, you know? Yeah. And, you know, these, these Aboriginal legends are much like the Native American legends because they were there first and they've right. been there a lot longer and they've seen some stuff yeah. and they passed this history down to their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. So the stories persisted, which is great because you know, just like in the U S a lot of folklore that, that lingers in certain regions is, is based on native American legends. So right. I'm sure th- the same holds true for Australia, that a lot of their legends go back to Aboriginal stories. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and indigenous Australians actually hold that the number of sightings, you can hear my neighbor with his, um, exhaust pipes over there being cool sorry about that (laughs) man you managed to find another neighbor like that i know i moved (laughs) almost 900 miles away and i got another one so it's just amazing okay here we go again so indigenous australians actually hold that the number of sightings has increased in conjunction with the ingression of europeans into the outback So more people, more people seeing it, more stories. Um, Now, it has been claimed that the first recorded uh, sighting dates back to 1838 in the book Six Months in South Australia. It is likely that the event uh, described is a different phenomenon. So a lot of people say that Men Men Lights, you know, first recorded 1838. Others say, no, that was something different, but. If there's another light phenomena in Australia, I don't, I don't know what it is, but right, you know. Now, in how many one, can you have, really? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, it's Australia; you can have a lot. Um, <laughs> now, in one way, the Min Min lights are similar to the Marfa lights and the Brown Mountain lights that we've discussed before, but in a lot of other cases, you know, they follow and or approach witnesses, which those lights never do. So. That was one of the things that sparked mine and Matt's interest in these lights rather than just being more lights off in the distance. You know, there's a lot of stories of people being chased, um, people approaching these lights and seeing them, you know, in in a different, different way than the Marfa lights are ever seen. And you'll see when we dig into some of these sightings, how they are different, how they do tend to chase people. Right. Um, which, which makes them a little bit scary. Oh yeah. Um, especially if you've never experienced it before and you think something may be coming after you, but I do recall one 
one story, and I, I think it was with the Brown Mountain Lights, um, of, of one uh, coming very, very near to a group of people um, that were, you know, on, on kind of a lookout area. Uh, but that what was really it. I mean, and it wasn't like chasing them. It just got very, very close. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Adam's right. You know, we don't really hear with those other two uh, other two situations, anybody being chased. And y you hear it pretty routinely with the Min yeah. Min lights. Right. All right. So let's real quick take a look at the Min Min Hotel itself. Now, in his article on Australia's most famous ghost light in the Sydney Morning Herald on January 25th, 1947, Bill Beatty described the Outback Hotel that gave name to these mysterious lights as a, quote, notorious shanty. Now, he goes on to describe it in this kind of macabre way. He says, quote, no spots on Earth were lower than some of these Western shanties of the Queensland of 70 odd years ago. The Min Min Hotel was regarded as the worst of these vicious dens. Dispensing adulterated liquor and drugs, the Min Min Hotel derived its profits from the process known as lambing down, unwary shearers and station hands who arrived there with large checks and still larger thirsts. Now, many of these men remained there. The fierce, doped spirits caused their deaths. Others were killed in wild brawls, or were murdered for their money, and at the rear of the hotel site, there is still to be seen the Min Min graveyard where these victims were buried, end quote. So according Can to you him, imagine? yeah, it's crazy. I, I mean, this place, I mean, you get in a bar fight, you get killed, somebody, somebody kills you for your money, and they just bury you out behind the hotel. Yeah, it's easier that way. Why deal with anything, you know? <laughs> We got we got another stiff in room six. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? Yep, and that's the thing. It, it, you either, you know, ran the risk of getting killed in a fight, or you ran the risk of dying from their doped up liquors. Um, you know, some people have said this is all a myth, and that the Min Min Hotel was just. I mean, yeah, they had more expensive liquor because they were way out in the middle of nowhere in Queensland. Um, so it took a lot to get the liquor there, but then others have said how, you know, vicious it really was. So you never really know, um, yeah. with something like that. It's like buying a beer at the airport. Yeah. They got a, they got a captive audience. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you want it, you'll pay $12 for it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So let's look at the town of Bullia, Queensland. Um, the town of Bullia was established in 1876 to service local grazers. Um, it got its name from the nearby waterhole, which was named Bullia by the local Pitta Pitta tribe. Now, the waterhole is a permanent water supply when the Burke River runs dry. So, very important out there in that area. Yeah. Now, Bullia is the administrative center of the Shire of the same name, located on the banks of the Burke River, named after the famous explorer. Burke and Wills were the first Europeans in the area on their ill-fated expedition to the Gulf of Carpentaria in 1860. So it was named after that guy, um, one of the first explorers. Now, the Shire comprises a vast 61,000 square kilometers with a population of some say 301 people. Other sources say 600 people. So big difference there, but somewhere between 300 and 600 people. Um, 250,000 sheep and 75,000 cattle. So obviously yeah. a lot more animals than people in that area. And a dozen hobbits. Yep. And a partridge in a pear tree. Well, it's the Shire. Right. Right. I got your joke. I'm just not giving it to you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So this is what it, I put up with, folks. <laughs> yeah, he loves it. You know he does. <laughs> now, Boya was a part of the Inland Sea a hundred million years ago. So there's a wealth of marine fossils found there and actually on display at the local Boya Stonehouse Museum. Now, the fact that there's so many fossils there in Boya 
means that there is a potential for gases and oils to have built up under the ground in this area. And like we talked in the Marfa lights, could this be part of what causes it? Well, to me, if they were just, and, and we'll get into the theories here in a little bit, but if, it, if they were just seen off in the distance, I might say, okay, I'll give, give some credence to that. But Matt's going to go through the stories and you'll see why we don't think that the theory that gases and oils built up under the surface and then igniting would actually be a good explanation for this. Yeah. Now, in Boya, they have built the Min Min Encounter, which has several animatronics in uh, in the building there that explain the different encounters and theories as to what the lights actually are. Now, my personal favorite is told and encapsulated in a painting in this thing. And you can see this in the Australian Skies 3 documentary if you go watch it. But apparently the old timers have said the Min Min lights are nothing more than an emu with a flashlight shoved up its butt. <laughs> I, I mean, I wish that I was making that up, but well, I'm not. I, I want to debunk that theory real quick. Okay. Number number one, number one, I, uh, I You've tried live- to put a, a, a flashlight up an emu's butt, haven't you? No, but this is really this is really a great story. Okay? I used to live not too far from Johnny Cash's house. Right. Okay? And he had emus. Yeah. And they would get out and they would get over the fence and stuff and they'd be out in the road. And people would call the police that didn't know and be like, hey, there's an ostrich in the uh, <laughs> the road. <laughs> Emus are mean, too. And, and so, well, they kick the living crap out of them. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering who has managed to get a hold of an emu and shove a flashlight in its butt. Right, right. <laughs> The other, then, then, of course, scientifically speaking, uh, if you did accomplish this, wouldn't the lights be running away from you instead of towards you? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> according to the the painting, the lights are coming out of the eyes of the emu. Oh, so, even better. Yeah. So I mean, you know, it, it's scientifically, I mean, spot on how <laughs> intestines work. <laughs> Light goes in one end and comes out the eyes of the other end. So. <laughs> It, that's it, how it works. Yeah, it's not <laughs> how you think that the light is out. I mean, it the, the light is going in, according to this theory. And, um, yeah, like I said, I wish I had made that up, but I did not. That That is actually a theory that some of the old timers have. Um, and <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a Tom and Jerry cartoon. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's like something we would have seen as kids and went, oh, yeah, that's cool. You put a light there and it comes out the eyes. That's great. That's how emus work. But if it worked, I'd do it every Halloween. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I'd have an emu not, farm not to myself. And, yeah. No, you would. You would. One of the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get into more of the theories here after a while, but let's go ahead and get into some of the sightings so that we don't draw this out too much. Matt's got some really cool sightings here to talk about. All right, so a lot of people consider seeing these lights as a bad omen. You know, the lights are known to approach or follow people, but will, but will disappear if you if you shoot at them or if you try to attack them. And the the legend says that if you chase the lights and you catch them, you'll never come back to tell the story. Right. Okay. So no one's ever accomplished this, so we don't we, we don't know. We hadn't put right. this to the test. We haven't heard that they've accomplished it. So that that's true. You know, somebody may have done it and then they're just gone and we don't know. They ended up behind the Min Men Hotel. But uh this is a really good story, and this is a this is really a retelling of, of the author's grandmother's experience with the lights. Okay, so it says one night in their youth, my grandmother and grandfather were driving across Nulabor 
supposedly the longest, flattest stretch of straight road in the world, 1,675 kilometers wow. in South Australia, which is one of the places these lights are commonly seen. Now, they both saw two lights appear in the rearview mirror behind them, and of course, they assumed it to be the headlights of another vehicle. They got concerned when the lights started getting closer at an increasingly fast speed, keeping in mind they were already traveling along the highway at over 110 kilometers per hour. Now, he says, my grandmother has many stories of experiences with ghosts and other unexplained happenings. So when the lights got close enough to their vehicle, they lit up the inside of the car and she said she felt a wave of intense uneasiness and fear rush over her. So she knew there wasn't something, there was something not right. Yeah. So, so just when they started to panic, not knowing if the other quote unquote car was just going to drive into them, the lights moved to the side as if they were going to pass them. They watched the lights move alongside their car, but just when they would have expected the lights to pass in front of them, they vanished. Hmm. And there was no car anywhere around them. No vehicle to be seen that had raced past or even swerved off the road. Just nothing. And that uneasy feeling went away. So that that doesn't sound like trapped gas or anything to me. No. Uh, no. Just just from that one account. I mean, you know, the, these people were, were being followed by these lights. And, and to when they give got you close an, enough to them, they disappeared. And to give you an uneasy feeling. You know, to, to right. inherently give you an uneasy feeling is not something that just a lit ball of gas would do. I, I wouldn't right. think, you know. Well, there were, there was a party in college. Yeah. That- yeah. <laughs> I probably went to the same party because I know where you're going. I was uneasy. I, I agree. So this next one comes from a station supervisor at Cloncurry Railway. A station supervisor at Cloncurry Railway Station. And he's told this story on film for paranormal investigators. And this one is included in the documentary Adam mentioned, The Australian Skies uh, Search for the Min Men. Now, it's interesting to point out this is Austral- Australian. Yeah, like it's alien. Not, Aus- not Australian. It's Australian. Like, right. a- yeah, like alien. Aust and then Aust are alien. There you go. So Supervisor Matthew Curo told the documentary maker Don Mears that he and two other workers had been able to get very close to the strange luminescence in 1997. He quoted quoted as saying it looked like a star on the ground. Um, He said they got very close to it within about 1.5 meters which is unusual um, as most see the lights kind of bouncing up and down on the horizon Mm -hmm. said it lasted 45 minutes and they interacted with it. And so he had to actually write a report on it for work. Amir says it varied in size from a headlight to a truck wheel and reacted to loud noises. Now the documentary maker said railway workers have had many men, men sightings and, have to take them seriously as they could be something that could lead to a derailment. Right. The railway supervisor told Mears he didn't know what the light was, but said it appeared to be sentient. Now, this one appeared to be intelligent and curious, he said. So here's a story where, you know, again, we've talked about people that have something to lose. You know, this guy's a railway supervisor. He has to report on potential hazards for trains that are coming through that area that he manages. And here come these lights. And and he knows full well that this could possibly be a hazard for a train that's coming through if they see a light ahead of them on the tracks. And could be another train or something. Yeah, so like you said, he had to, he has to fill out a report when this stuff happens because it's it's a hazard. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is, but can you imagine being a railway supervisor going, "Hey, listen, man, we got some strange lights out here. 
I don't know what they are, but they keep occurring. And, you know, they, they seem to be intelligent. They, they yeah. know what they're doing. They react to loud noises. You know, we've had some interaction with them. We're not sure what they are, but here's my report on this stuff just in case it happens again. And, you know, a conductor on a train sees them. This is what's going on. Uh, you know, somebody could easily read that report and go, man, this guy is a, he's a loony. Yeah, We got to get right, him man. out of this position. He's been working too hard. You know, he's overstressed. He's seeing stuff. Right. He's hallucinating on the job or taking drugs on the job or something. Yeah. But I mean, at least he felt responsible enough that he's like, I've got to report this because this could be a problem. I mean, he could have easily said, right. listen, we don't know what this is, but we ain't going to talk about it because <laughs> people are going to think we're crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I always wonder how many of these strange sightings of other things occur and people do not report them simply because they're afraid of some type of retribution. Yep. I've wondered about that, too, because we and so many people will criticize witnesses that a lot of people probably don't come forward. You know, you talk about Bigfoot or UFOs or anything like that. You probably have a lot of people that have seen stuff like that and they just don't come forward and share their story because they don't want to be ridiculed. So yeah. we probably get a very minuscule amount of actual sighting data. Yeah. And, you know, like we've said before, you know, if, if you're going to come forward with a story like this or story of, of a haunting or anything like that, you may not necessarily want that kind of notoriety. Mm -hmm. because with, with all of the interest comes all of the skepticism. Oh yeah. And and it's all going to be directed at you. So you, you really put yourself out there when you make a report like this. Yep. Now, is there something interfering with your happiness or that's preventing you from achieving your goals? Kind of like maybe your town is on lockdown and you know you can't can't visit your family and you're kind of depressed because you haven't seen your family believe me i get it i'm i'm there with you um, this has been a long year and we all have stuff going on you know um we're all processing all of this in different ways and better help is is there for you and better help will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist so you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Remember, it's not a crisis line and it's not a self-help line. This is professional counseling done securely online. And there's a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. And that's true. If you're in a smaller town. You may not have access to the types of therapists that they do on BetterHelp. Yeah, and this service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as you do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed, which is really, really great. I mean, sometimes you just don't mm -hmm. click with somebody and you need somebody different. And that may not be an option with traditional therapy, but BetterHelp right. makes it easy and free. Now, it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. You can visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Grave. That's Better H-E-L-P slash Grave, G-R-A-V-E, and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. That's right. All you got to do is go to BetterHelp.com slash Grave. That's Better H-E-L-P dot com slash G-R-A-V-E, and join over the 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. But these eerie lights, 
have been seen, like Adam said, uh, all the way back into the 1800s, and they have been documented as being seen in the early 1890s hovering over a grave at the rear of the Min Min Hotel. We heard Adam discuss the graves in the back of the hotel. And that's along the Kennedy Development Road from Winton to Boulia. Now, this particular grave where the lights were seen happens to be the resting place of Mary Lilly, who was the wife of the man who built the hotel. Now, there is a legend that goes along with this that Miss Lily would would walk through at night and carry a lantern and check on all of the guests, you know, making sure they had what they need, possibly even making sure they got some other services that mm-hmm. the hotel quietly provided. Right. But after she died, they... And, and that well, the, yeah, and the hotel had burned down. There's a legend that goes along with the lights are, you know, the spirit of Mary Lily wandering through, checking on her guests. You know, neat story. Yeah, it's it's kind of like the railway guy going and looking for his head. You know, walking yeah. down the railroad track. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's a it's a good legend, but you know, when you take it. When you take it at face value, it's a good legend. Yeah. But when you take it in conjunction with the history of how long they've been seen, it's like, well, kind of just a story, you know, yeah. kind of just somebody trying to explain this phenomenon that's been happening. Yeah. And it seems like even the hotel itself, you know, has has stories and folklore surrounding it. So mm-hmm. um, you just take it, take it for what it's worth. It's a neat story. Yep, yep exactly. But, but this next sighting comes from Genevieve Hammond, who lives in Boulia. Now, Genevieve says that on this particular night, the sky was clear, it was cold, and there was nothing and no one near them. Yet, the Hammonds felt like they weren't alone. Hammond says we were on a remote cattle station, and they run Boulia's Desert Sand Motel. Said we were camping out. And we saw this greenish oval shaped blurry light bobbing up and down. It was parallel to the horizon about a kilometer away. And it seemed to be a meter from the ground. It moved very slowly to the left and then came back on itself. And it went on like this for about 15 minutes. It was silent and very eerie. She said, we were trying to think, could it be a neighbor or a car? But the nearest homestead in that direction was 120 kilometers away. So the next day, John O'Hammond went over to see where the light was and couldn't find anything. So he said it couldn't have been anything else. There's no other explanation. This was the Min Min lights. Right. Since he found no tracks or like car tracks or anything. Yeah. No tracks, no tire marks, no evidence that there were campers out that way. Or that there was any any kind of you know human uh, presence there at all, right? Um, n- no no source of light, you know, n- nothing mechanical, nothing on fire, uh, you know, n- nothing that showed burn marks. You know, everything mm-hmm. was just as it should be. So there really wasn't an explanation for this light going around for fifteen minutes. Yeah. Now. Uh, this is a sighting by Paul and Jane Hotchkit, Hotchkiss in July of 2018. Now, this story is in their own words, so I'm just going to read this one to you. It says, last night, April 7th, 2018, at Peak Creek, 60 kilometers north of Boulia, we looked out of the van at 9 p.m. to find a large yellowish light like a spotlight high about twice the height of the surrounding trees. The light moved over a period both up and down, left and right, coming closer than dropping below the tree line, or we could not see it until it moved left and right, and it shone through the trees again. It eventually moved away until it disappeared around 9.30 p.m. So, again, we're... We're seeing movement of light that isn't consistent with 
just a natural phenomenon or right. swamp gas, you know, yeah. you know, burning fossil fuel or, or pockets of gas that had become ignited or even headlights of a car. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're not going to see headlights of a car or even the reflection of the headlights of a car possibly over the tree line and not for that length of time. I mean, no. you and might like, would see headlights pass briefly, yeah, but not for a half hour. Right. And like we talked in the Marfa, uh, the Marfa lights, when the headlights theory to me is kind of a, it's kind of grasping at straws in a way. And, and when we get to the theory section, we'll talk about why they're saying it could be headlights, but you wouldn't see car headlights moving right, then moving left, then moving up, then moving down, then right again, then left again. They don't move that. They would go in a straight line. And in the Australian Skies documentary, the guy actually sees what he originally thought was the Marfa, uh, the Marfa lights, the Min Min lights, but then debunked them as headlights because they stayed in a straight line the whole time. Mm-hmm. You know, they they didn't bounce. They didn't. Any, they just showed up and then moved in a straight line. And then eventually you could hear the vehicle passing. Yeah. So if, you know, if they were headlights, I'm pretty certain they would stay in a straight line and people would hear the vehicle. And I'm sure there's been plenty of reports of the lights that were exactly that. Yeah. You know, they yeah. were just they were just mistaken. Um. But it does seem like for a lot of these stories, they're they're not headlights. No, the the, the you know they they're just not they're moving too much in my opinion to be considered headlights and for too long. Right, right. So this is a sighting by Marsha Paxton in July of 2017. Now note these are these are fairly current. I mean, these are within the last few years. People are still seeing these lights. So this is oh, yeah. not an old phenomenon. I mean, we're talking about something that's been around for well over 100 years. Yeah. And you could go out there and probably see them to this day. Yeah. In fact, you know, it, they're so active that, you know, that they almost guarantee that, that you'll see them at some point if you try. You right. know, if you're out there enough, you will see them. But uh, Marsha Paxton says that, you know, she says you wouldn't believe it. And she says she found it hard to believe herself. She said they were staying at a Bullia caravan park on Monday, the 3rd, July, 2017, 2017. I was woken by a bad dream and got out of bed as I couldn't sleep. I decided to go outside. I had no idea what time it was, but later worked out that would have approximately been 530 a.m. It was still very, very dark. It was a beautiful night, totally clear with thousands of stars. She says she noticed just above the trees to the northeast a very large, intense circle like a full moon, but more white light. Said it wasn't the moon. It was only about a half moon, and it was high in the sky. So Paxton says she quickly ran in and got her husband, John, out of bed, and he wasn't really happy about being woken up at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> but when he saw the bright glowing circle, they both agreed that they were looking at something very, very special. And Paxton says she didn't even know at that time what a Min Min looked like. Said after going to the visitor center, she saw other photos of Min Mins. And she says her photo is exactly the same. She says she's amazed that both John and her have seen a Min Min, and they hope that it's lucky, and and they wondered why they were chosen to see it. I mean, you know that that's another one of these oddball stories. Now, could could it have been the moon? I don't know. Maybe at five maybe. thirty in the morning. Yeah, I mean, you if it's dark, you can still see the moon sometimes. But most people would know what they're looking at if they're looking at the moon and go, yep. "Hey, this isn't the moon." It's, right. You know, it does. It it looks like it could be the moon, but it's not the moon. Um, yep. I, I wish she'd have gone. Yeah, because the moon was over here. Yeah, I was about to say it would have been even better if she just said, "I see the moon too." Yeah, you know. Yeah. 
look, look at this. Here's the moon, and here's what we saw. Mm-hmm. Not the same. <laughs> now, he, that, like I said, lots of stories. Here's another one. A lady named uh, Shaney Pracy was returning to Eva Valley from Mataranka, Mataranka. I, I think I may have said that correctly. You but might I, have. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just making myself feel better. We're going we're to get somebody to go, nah, that's not how you say that. Well, we did a show where we had all these Australian names and we were, were trying our best to pronounce them. And we got like tons of emails. I'm like, oh, you know, y'all, you guys did a pretty good job, but this is actually pronounced this. And I'm like, yep. I would have never gotten that out of that word ever not in a million years (laughs) i I remember that but anyway i digress so pracy was was returning from mataranka with her partner and three young children when they noticed uh what they think might have been a min min light she says they were about 10 to 15 kilometers out of mataranka and her partner said do you see that light and it started flickering from one side of the car and then jumped to the other. They said, we parked behind a small tree to see if it moved or if it was just a star, and it, and it didn't. And then it came out from behind the tree. It looked as if it was following the car, and it would come down towards the car about 100 to 200 meters away. Now, you know, we get a lot of people that, that see them in cars, Mm-hmm. And that have a feeling that it's either approaching them or it's coming up behind them. Um, and I mean, you know, you got to think that that's kind of creepy. Yeah. You know, if you even if you think, oh, that, that's just headlights. I don't want to see headlights coming at me at a high speed from either direction. <laughs> right. Well, and there was a, a video of somebody that actually filmed a light behind them. And they said you could hear him in the video saying, you know, I wanted to see one of these, but now that I've seen it, I don't know that I really want to. They're scared and they're like, should we pull over and see if it actually, you know, passes or if it stays with us? And the other person goes, don't pull over. I don't want to get abducted. So, (laughs) I mean, that that, that is a thought, you know, what, you know, people think maybe it could be alien. Yeah. I don't know. But, you know, suffice it to say, Miss Pracy was pretty freaked out. And after posting the experience to the Catherine and NT Issues Facebook page, uh, people suggested that the movements of the light sounded like Min Min lights or a weather balloon. <laughs> weather balloon. Or, or a weather balloon. I've uh, never seen a weather balloon, but they get blamed for an awful lot of stuff, you know? Yeah, they do. It seems like it's a, a common... Uh, let's just say it was either a stork, an owl, or a weather balloon. Yeah. But even Pracy says that she had heard many stories of the Min Min lights, but never thought she would experience them. But even goes on to say, don't follow them. If you do, you will not return. Hmm. So, I mean, there is there is that idea that th- this may be something sinister and that it, it would be better off left alone. Yeah. You know, experience it for what it is and just let it be. Right. Now, these next two, um, these are these are really interesting. The first one is, is a is a very popular account by a man named Ted Baines, and his experience was in 1992. Now, Ted was about 100 kilometers from Warwick in southwest Queensland when his truck broke down. Baines decided he would leave the area to get help, but no one who passed him on the road would stop. The sun was setting, so Ted started to walk back to his vehicle. While on his way, he saw a flashing light appear on the road behind him. Now, Ted knew what it was because he had seen it 40 years before while traveling with his wife. Oh, wow. And Ted remembered that no one believed him then, and he was certain that no one would believe him now. But to Ted, the lights were known as Patty's Lantern, which is another name for the Min Min lights. 
Now, Ted said he stilled himself and he headed straight for the light. But just suddenly as it appeared, it vanished. He got too close. Yeah. And so, yeah. So Patty's Lantern is, is another is another name um, for the Men Men Lights. And I don't know if if you saw that as well, Adam, in your stuff, that that Patty's Lantern. Um, there were a few other. I think I only saw it one time. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, you know, I tried to find a legend that was associated directly with the term Patty's Lantern. And all I was able to really find is, you know, like uh, references to Men Men Lights and, and a coffee shop. Hmm. So, you know, I'm not really sure, and I'm sure somebody knows what what would have uh what would have given them the name Patty's Lantern but again it's it's I'm sure it's it's based on you know some some older legend um and how they got that name but anyway that's that's what Ted knew the Men Men Lights as right but uh Cole Ribbo he also had a, a kind of creepy experience with Men Men Lights or Patty's Lantern. Now, Ribbo calls, recalls that it was 1975 and he was working on installing a window in his home. Now, as he looked out towards the mountain, he saw a bright glowing ball of light that he estimated was about two to 300 feet in diameter. He initially thought that a tractor he had been working on earlier had caught fire. So he that drove out to investigate. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, tractor fire. Yeah. Um, so so he drove out to investigate, but on the way, the light stopped. Now, when he reached the shed where the tractor was, he didn't find anything wrong. So Cole says he went back to the house to find his wife in hysterics about the light and the fact that it went out before he could reach it. But then the light appeared again. This time, he decided he would walk. Now, setting out on foot, he remembers walking past some of his old cars, and he described the light as appearing incandescent or like a neon tube. Now, as he passed one of the cars, he opened the door. And Cole noticed that the light was somehow lighting the floor mats that were under the dash, which seemed impossible since the light was coming through the windshield from the front of the car and anything under the dashboard would have been in shadow. Right. So he says the light seemed to bend around everything to, to light up anything there. And so we've heard that, that from like uh, UFO encounters about the lights on the, on the craft, how it doesn't obey the actual... Uh, you know, laws of physics that we have for the way light travels, that it actually acts more like maybe a liquid where it would flow down over something and pool. So that's kind of right. what this sounds like is that it's flowing down over the dash and then pooling in the, the floorboards kind of like liquid would. Right. But he says that the light was bright enough to have read a newspaper. Cole said the nucleus of the light, was up off the ground but to reach it he would have had to walk through dense thorny brush now he stopped right here because he was afraid that if he was to get into the brush and the light went off it would leave him stranded in the dark on dangerous ground yeah so the next day cole talked to his neighbor who had also seen the light and the neighbor said he thought it was someone who was trying to climb down the side of one of the cliffs with a pressure lantern now, the neighbor said that he went out there shouting, telling whoever it may have been to turn back. But after sunrise, the neighbor had gone out to see if he could see tracks or even perhaps a body of someone who had fallen, but found nothing. So, I mean, these are these are two interesting stories because, you know, these guys told their story pretty routinely and were consistent with it. Right. And, you know, uh, Ribo's story coincides with his neighbor 
They both saw the light at the same time. They Neither one of them knew what it was, and they had their own assumptions as to what it could have been, um, but they didn't find any evidence to back it up. So nothing that, that they saw had a really good explanation that they could come up with. And if this light was as large as what Ribbo describes, two to 300 feet in diameter, I mean, that's, that's, that's huge. Yeah. And so just, I don't know, put yourself in his shoes for a moment and think about, you know, nighttime at your own house and you, you're you working on a window and you look out across the, what he calls the paddock. Um, you know, you look out across your backyard and all of a sudden there's a two to 300 foot ball of light out there. Yeah. I mean, that, that would freak, freak you the hell out, really. Oh, I yeah. Mean, Oh yeah. I mean, alien would be the first thing in my mind for yep. sure. Mine too. Mine too. So, I mean, you know, like we said at the beginning, these these lights are not they're they're similar in that they're odd light phenomena to the Marfa lights to the Brown Mountain lights, but they just don't behave the same. And although there's not been any cases of anyone being harmed or or anything like that, they definitely have more of an eerie aspect to them. And, you know, people kind of respect them. Mm -hmm. so they, like, don't, you know, don't, don't chase them. Don't, don't mess with them. Uh, they're, they're probably best left alone. And I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, I've never seen any lights. I've seen some weird lights. I've never seen anything like this. Right. Me either. There was one that I heard um, a guy when he was at work, it was night, and he had a coworker with him, and they actually saw one of these lights. So they were in the truck, and they were pulling up close to it to try to see what it was. And, and it was on, like, it was on the bank of a river, and it was on the same side of the river that they were on. And they pulled up to it, and when their headlights hit it, it kind of fluttered a little bit. And yeah. then it moved across the river to the other side. And so the guy got out. His coworker stayed in the car, and he said he was cussing him for getting out because he didn't want to deal with this, you know. Um, but he got out with a flashlight, and as he would shine it on the, the Min Min light, it would kind of go out, waver. You know, it, it wouldn't stay the same brightness. And if he hollered at it, it would go dark. So when, when any noise happened, you know, it would go out and he said it went out for a little bit and he kept staring in the same spot that that light was right. And he said he saw something in the darkness that looked darker than the darkness. So it looked like there was an actual physical object there that mm -hmm. just turned off and yeah. then it turned back on a little bit later and he saw the light with the fuzzy edges that everybody kind of describes. And he said it was a good long uh, sighting, you know, 15, 20 minutes or something that they were interacting with this light. And that stuck with me because of him saying that it seemed like there was actually an object there even when it went out. So that makes me wonder what could that have been? Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's tons of stories. These were just some of the ones that I grabbed that were the most unusual. And there was really not a way to chalk them up to a natural phenomenon or, you know, a, a human creating mm -hmm. the light because there wasn't evidence of any humans being around at the time. And we certainly know there's not, there's not going to be a human with a with a flashlight or a pressure lantern or or anything that's going to be able to run fast enough to catch up to a car and then run beside it without the people in the car seeing something. Right. Right. You would see the people running beside your car. Yeah. So, Adam, if 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 these lights are not natural, if if they're not man-made, then what the heck could they be? Well, let's look at that um, there because there are a lot of theories and, and I, you know, I'll preface this by saying I don't know that I believe any of these, but <laughs> we still got to we still got to talk about them. 
Now, Curtis Roman, a senior lecturer at Charles Darwin University, said there were several scientific theories that could explain the phenomenon. Quote, one is that there are mirage caused by natural gases or warm air and cold air coming together. He also said, quote, some, some of the other theories are that they are bioluminescent insects, owls, or birds. So let's look at these. The first one, what he's discussing as a mirage is the uh, Fata Morgana or Fata Morgana. Mm -hmm. And we discussed this a little bit in our Marfa Lights episode, but the Fata Morgana is a superior mirage that is seen in a narrow band right above the horizon. The optical phenomena occurs because rays of light are bent when they pass through air layers of different temperatures in a steep thermal inversion where an atmospheric duct has formed. Now, a thermal inversion is an atmospheric condition where warmer air exists in a well-defined layer above a layer of significantly cooler air. Now, this temperature inversion is the opposite of what is normally the case. So air is usually warmer close to the surface and cooler higher up. So this temperature inversion, they say, and, and we see it in things all the time, um, when you see like a mountain floating above the water or you see right. a ship floating above, that's the uh, Fata Morgana. But does this explain the the Min Min lights and how they chase people and they move? And I don't think so. Right. And there was actually a professor at the University of Queensland named Jack Pettigrew who put this idea to the test. Now, you know, Pettigrew believes that he's he solved the mystery because he thought he had created his own Min Min light. But he says he says the lights are real for sure, but he says they're distant lights, uh, a fire or bright headlights. Now, he says, you know, you can't see them as they're over the horizon and they're too faint. But he says this this layer of cold air keeps it close enough to the ground so that it can be seen over great distances. Now, the layer of cold air can concentrate the distant light and stop it from spreading so that it doesn't get weakened by long distances. And so, when I mean, when we're talking long distances, let me, let me tell you what he did. He, he used geometry to show that a Min Min light was actually a very bright truck headlight up to 300 kilometers away. Now, to make his point, uh, he drove 10 kilometers from a campsite and shined his headlights at the campsite, which re they reported as a bobbing light just above the horizon, changing from red to orange, yellow and to green. And, you know, we, we know that light can change color based on the atmosphere. I mean, you know, look at yeah, a the sunset. refraction. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so we, we know that's possible. And we know that this, this particular temperature phenomenon is possible. But that really only explained, would explain the bouncing light. You know, the ones that people see from, you know, that look far away, that bounce up and down on the horizon. Right. That that could be a potential explanation for those, but it just doesn't explain all of them. No, we're, not at all. Where we're so many people experience that, that feeling of the lights following them. Now, if I'm looking straight ahead and I see a light bouncing on the horizon, you know, maybe at some point as the light changes or as I'm moving, the light may appear to be coming towards me. I, I can I can kind of get get behind that. I can wrap my head around it. But I don't understand how that would be the case if I'm moving away from the light source, regardless of how far it is, that I'm going to get this sense that the lights are coming fast behind me. And we, right. we heard that. We've heard that in several stories. And especially if the light got close enough to me to to essentially overtake me, mm -hmm. it it just it to me it doesn't explain that. No, it might, like you said, explain a few of the sightings, 
But the Pettigrew guy says this explains all of them. This explains the entire men, men light phenomena. And I just don't believe that. You know, so essentially what he's saying is those other sightings are exaggerations. Um, that yeah. It, it wasn't as dramatic as the description may be. And I mean, that may that may be true, but there's just so many of them. I don't think you can just dismiss them as be all being over dramatic. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Now, the um, Curtis Roman made another theory that they could be bioluminescent creatures. He said insects, owls or birds. And I, I've heard people say that they're fireflies um, or lightning bugs. But it, it, I, I don't see how that's the case either. Them being as big as they're said to be, you're not even going to have a whole pile of them that are, you know, hundreds of kilometers wide, like the one report said. And when they get close enough to you, you would be able to tell that they're individual fireflies in a ball. So I, I'm not going to go with that one. But if we're looking at bioluminescent creatures in Australia, um, Australia and New Zealand are the only places in the world where you can see glow worms um, in C2. Now, places like um, Glowworm Den in Boonda Noon, New South Wales, and the Melba Gully in the Great Otway National Park are popular, not just with tourists, but local people too. Now, the worms... Um, Australia is actually home to eight recognized glowworm species, and they're known as, you know, the uh, a spectacular living light. But they're not actually worms. They're larvae of a primitive fly, the fungus gnat, and they form a large component of the insect's boom and bust life cycle, quote unquote. Now, they can be found in dense rainforest uh, of Gondwana origin in caves or rocky structures thriving in permanently wet habitats. Now, we know that a lot of where these are seen in Boulia is not a permanently wet habitat. Right. You know, there's a lot of sand, a lot of desert out in that area. So I, I, I doubt they're worms hanging from trees or anything, and they're not in caves. So you've got to cross out the bioluminescent worms. Another bioluminescent creature in Australia is a sea snail, and it's called the yellow-coated cluster wink. Um, it's able to use its shell kind of like a lampshade, filtering the light given off by natural glowing cells, and this is to ward off predators. Well, that's in the sea. That's not in the air. <laughs> yeah. Um, another bioluminescent creature is a scorpion, and we all know that they glow in the presence of UV light. Um, not exactly sure why they glow, but they glow at some form of communication, I guess, between the species of scorpion. I'd prefer, also, I prefer scorpions to glow. Yeah. That way I think you can they should them. all glow all the time mm -hmm. so that I could see them and not step on them. I, I a hundred percent agree with you. Cause I, I think that that would probably keep me from ever moving to a desert. You know, yep. I don't, I don't like spiders. I'm not scared <laughs> of spiders. As long as I know they're there, I'm I'm fine. Yep. I don't want to step on one. But a scorpion, yep. I, I don't dig. You know? no. And if it would have a little light that goes, hey, I'm a scorpion crawling around here, I'd be like, hey, hey, my scorpion, get the hell out of my yard. Yep, exactly. You could <laughs> You're not allowed in the house. A lot easier. <laughs> right. Um, now, there are also coral, fungi, and algae that are known to glow in Australia. Now, I looked... And I couldn't find any mention of bioluminescent birds or bats in Australia. Now, not that one couldn't have evolved, um, but I think there would be a lot more signs of lights being a flying creature than we see now if this were true. So I, I, I doubt that it's a bioluminescent bird or bat like this guy is saying. Another theory is that it's gases igniting like we talked about. But I don't see this as being viable, just like I didn't really see it for Marfa. Um, I can see it more in Marfa because the lights are always seen far away. Mm -hmm. um, and they're seen, you know, kind of bouncing and bobbing in the distance. I don't see it at all for the Min Min lights because they're 
and they're said to chase people. They they move a lot. Um, they just don't react like you would think a ball of lit gases would. Um, theory I had that I thought about was um, ball lightning. Mm-hmm. And we probably need to do an episode on ball lightning just to kind of clear all this up. But uh, ball lightning is a theorized phenomena that occurs. Um, they don't know how it's created or anything like that. And I don't think that this is ball lightning happening all the time because it's not the right conditions that they theorize for ball lightning, but it's a thought. It's another glowing ball of light, but I don't know what it is. You know, I, none of those theories sit well with me and I, I don't think they explain it well enough. I mean, what do you think, Matt? Well, you know, with ball lightning, I, I hate explaining one theory with another theory. Yeah. You know, and that's essentially what, what would be happening with, if you were going to use ball lightning as, as a, right. Right. As a potential cause. That's true. Of the men, men lights. Um, but I'm with you. I, I, I think probably if we took 200 sightings, um, you could probably chunk 50% of them, um, because it was, headlights or ignited gas and with the idea of of being out there and knowing that people have reported seeing the lights you're you're going to be predisposed to see any light as a possible min min light but right. you you take the other half and and maybe maybe you cut out you know 25% to people that just you know, they, they mistook what they saw or they were a little over dramatic and maybe it, it wasn't as, as, as big or didn't move as much or whatever, but then you've got the rest, you know, you've got, I, I don't know, 50 to 75 out of 200 stories that you just can't put them in a box because they don't fit. Right. You know, they're, you, you can't explain it away with with a mirage, you really can't say that they were somewhere where they would have experienced a bioluminescent insect. And, and you're, you look at it and you say, I, I can't explain why they moved. You know, mm-hmm. I can't explain why they react to sound. You know, I just, I just can't explain it, but I'm going to shove all these in this box too. And just say, eh, it, it, it's one of these things. So, you know, just like with everything else, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have a lot of stories that they just, they're not accurate, maybe not misleading or, you know, a hoax, but you know, you, you just have that mindset. If you're out there, like, what if I see them and anything you see, you're going to be like, was that one, was that one? And you come home and you tell this story and you're like, we saw these lights and I was like, Oh, you saw the men, men lights. Well, maybe not, probably not. Yeah. But I think enough people have that you you can't just look at it and say, yeah, we're going to make your your square peg fit in this round hole. Um, right. But it is it is an amazing phenomenon, you know, whether we're talking about the Min Min lights or the Marfa lights or Brown Mountain, um, because they don't have a really good explanation and people continue to see them. Mm-hmm. So you would think it, it over that period of time in Australia, somebody would have been able to get close enough to one to go, hey, this is what it is. But they yeah. haven't. Or or if they have, they didn't live to tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. The emu with the flashlight killed them. That's something. right. <laughs> they got kicked by an emu with a flashlight in its butt. But what do you guys think? I mean, I know we have tons of listeners in Australia, and I'm sure mm-hmm. that you guys have heard of the Min Min lights. And and I would imagine a few of you may have even seen them or have have friends or family that have witnessed them. And, you know, those are stories that Adam and I would love to hear, uh, Absolutely. Spe- especially if you if you've got, you know, a, a, a you know story from your parents or from your grandparents that they've just kind of said, you know, hey, we were out in Queensland and this is what we saw. Or, or yeah. maybe, you know, ask them, you know, you ever heard of this? Did you ever meet anybody that said they saw these strange lights? And, uh, and yeah, those are, those are fantastic stories. We'd love you to share them with us. 
Please do. And the best place to do that is in our Facebook group. If you if you haven't gotten in there yet, please do. I mean, it is a wonderful place. We have thousands of members and and it's a nice safe place for you to share stories like this without, you know, feeling like you're going to be ridiculed or made fun of. Everybody is just in there to have a good time and to share some really great spooky stories, some personal experiences and whatnot. Uh, so we encourage you to jump in there. Adam and I interact in there as well. Um, so it's it's just a it's just a great way for our listeners to connect with us and and one another. And while you're there, uh, you can uh, check us out on other social media uh, on Twitter and on Instagram. And you can go to our website, which is graveyardpodcast.com. And on our website, we have links to purchase Graveyard Tales merchandise. Uh, you can listen to the show, find out a little bit more about Adam and myself, and you can, and you can become a patron. And we always take this time to thank everyone who has donated to the show. It really, it really helps Adam and I keep it going. Um, but uh, please uh, rate and review us on iTunes. That is the easiest way to get us up the charts and to bring more people into the graveyard. So I think uh, I think this is a wrap for the Min Min Lights, my man. Yes, sir. I think so. So until next time, we'll save you a seat in the graveyard. See you soon. The railway supervisor told Mears he didn't know what the light was, but said it appeared to be sentient. Sentient. That's the word. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Here we go.